Okay, this unit is all about electrons in the periodic table. So let's start off with a diagram that we call the Bohr model. The Bohr model over here shows us that the atom is broken up into different energy levels. This particular diagram shows seven energy levels. Uh, not all atoms have seven energy levels, right? So this is like the most that you will ever see. Okay, so um, the importance of the Bohr model is that it explains to us where electrons are housed and what happens when energy is absorbed. So there's this term ground state. The ground states are the electrons in their state of lowest energy. It's kind of like just their normal residence. It's where we typically expect the electrons to be. Okay. Um, Oh, I should mention this term here too, quantized. So the term quantized means that the, ener the electrons uh, are specifically relegated to certain energy levels. And while the electrons can move between energy levels, they cannot be in between energy levels. Just like stairs. When you're walking up stairs, if there's five stairs, you're either on the fourth stair or the third stair. You can't be in the, on stair 3.5. Okay. That's the same thing with energy levels for electrons. They're either in energy level 2 or energy level 3 or energy level 4, but they're just not found in between the levels. Okay. Is there space in between levels? There is space, but they, they, they can't exist there. Right? And this has to do with the mathematical computation of their waveform pattern, which is governed by something called the Schrodinger equation, which we're not going to cover. Okay. It's, you know, like in, gra in, in math, you ever graph things with nodes? Right, how node is a null space. That's the same idea here. Okay, so in an atom, electrons in any energy level can absorb energy. So let's say here we've got an electron in energy level one, right? This, this first ring here is energy level one. Well, electrons can absorb energy, and if they absorb energy, then they rise to some higher energy level that higher energy level is what we call the excited state. All right? Now, the excited state is temporary. It's very fleeting. It only exists there for a short period of time, like as in fraction of a second, okay? Hundredth of a second, like. So the, elect the electron will fall back down to the lower energy level from its, it'll fall back down to its ground state where it came from. So in our picture here, the electron jumped up and then it falls back down to where it came from. Now this falling back down is very important because during, if it absorbed, if the electron absorbed energy to rise up, that same amount of energy must be released. And when it is released, the energy is released in the form of what we call a photon. A photon is often called a packet of light. Okay, small, it's like a light particle is what it is. So photon, with the difference in energy. So just judging by this diagram alone, you can imagine if an electron is promoted several levels, then it must have absorbed lots of energy as opposed to just like rising one level. So how much energy an atom absorbs is going to be reflected in the electron, how far it travels, and then how far it falls back down to return. So you can have electrons falling you know, at various intervals, wherever, whatever energy level it starts at, it can absorb different amounts of energy and it might jump one level, two level, three levels, four levels, just depends on how much energy it absorbed. Yes, Karan? What causes them to absorb energy or what actually? Okay, so the sources of energy for electrons to be excited can be uh, direct electricity input. It can be a reaction uh, that, um, if it, like an atom is ionized during like a redox reaction, 
it could be heat, right? So those are the three primary sources. And actually, even, even another light source can excite the electrons to cause them to jump up and down. And we see this happening in metals, which is why metals look shiny, right? Because the, the light, the white light coming from the sun or from a light bulb hits the metal, electrons are bouncing up and down. And it's, it's because so many of them are falling up and down where all the lights colors are produced, which ends up looking like white, which is why, what shiny metal looks like. Okay. So electrons absorb energy, they jump up, they fall back down, they release a photon. So the photons is a light particle and photons have wave characteristics. The fact that it's a light particle and wave characteristics, uh, they say that light has a dual nature dual nature of light in that it is both a wave and particle, meaning it is governed by the mathematical laws that describe waves, but it is also governed by the mathematical laws that describe particles and mass. And we'll kind of delve into those one at a time. So let's talk basics about a wave. By definition, a wave has to have both a crest and a trough. All right, so the crest is the top portion. The trough is the bottom portion. And they both will have the same ma um, magnitude from the origin. So the distance from here to here and the distance from here to here, these are the same. Okay, it's like a sine wave. Now, when observing waves, this entire distance that includes one crest and one trough is called the wavelength. Now, keep in mind that when you observe pictures of waves, don't be thrown if the wave starts at a different place. Like if it starts something like this, a picture of a wave like this still contains one complete crest and one complete trough. Do you guys see that? It's just that they start with half a crest, then a trough, and then half a crest. So here and here constitutes one full crest. Okay. All right. And then there is the amplitude. Amplitude is the distance from the origin to the crest to the different uh, to the trough. Um, it's a measure of intensity. Um, and that's, that's all we're going to say about it. We're not actually going to calculate power here in, in this class. That's, that's, you know, you'll do that in physics maybe. So if we know what a wavelength is, we should talk about frequency. Frequency is how many waves pass a fixed point per second. So if I draw another picture of a wave... that looks like this. This second wave, we'll call this wave B, in the same span of time, twice as many waves pass by. So B's frequency is twice that of wave A. Does that make sense? If the distance that I have drawn that represents here, you know, this purple wavelength here, the wavelength of B is half that of the wavelength of A, which means twice as many waves of B will pass. Okay? Uh, that's an inverse relationship. The longer the wave, the lower the frequency, or the shorter the wave, the higher the frequency. Because the passage of time is constant. Therefore, the units that we will use to measure these for wavelength, we're going to use meters. But, you know, there will also be variants. There will be things like nanometers, centimeters, millimeters. Whatever the unit is, you're going to be converting it to meters. For frequency, because we're counting waves that pass a fixed point, originally it was waves per second. 
And then they just decided to drop the word waves, and now it's just called uh, inverse seconds, or s to the minus 1, or hz, because a wave per second is called a hertz. So you will see, you will see all of these presented to you in either problems or labs or books or wherever. Right? Just know that these all mean the same thing. Okay. So, the basic characteristic of waves, you need to understand the wavelength and its relationship to frequency. The shorter the wave, the more frequent, the higher the frequency will be. Okay, so if a photon is a packet of light, light is electromagnetic radiation. There is a spectrum, uh, like a, var a variance, between different types of light. Now, the reason why there's different types of light is because of the wavelength and frequency. So, if we take a look at this graphic here, Photons can have long wavelengths, like on this end, or short, like on this end. And as the wavelength varies, as they get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, the frequency increases. Of the entire known electromagnetic spectrum, we can only interpret a small sliver, and that's what's known as the visible spectrum. Now, even within that small sliver that we can interpret, that is broken up and by what you know as colors. So when the wavelength is 750 nanometers, that is the very, very edge of our visible range, that's red. And then as the wavelength shrinks and gets shorter and shorter and shorter, the color changes from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to indigo and then to violet. So Roy G. Biv. So if we just talk about visible light and I said, all right, well, what is the longest wavelength of visible light? I would expect that you know red. Okay, the shortest wavelength for visible light is violet. And then it's kind of everything else is in between. But then, as those waves, as those wavelengths get shorter and shorter, then the, the, we reach ultraviolet. And ultraviolet, you know, is, when you hear that, what's the first thing you think of? The sun. The sun, sunglasses. When you buy sunglasses, there's usually a little plastic sticker on it that says it's UVA or UVB approved or whatever, right? And so ultraviolet rays are generally bad for you in high quantities. So you can't lie down at noon on a tropical beach like all day. Well, noon wouldn't be all day, but you know what I mean? You can't lie down all day in the sun because as the sunlight intensifies, all of those UV rays that you're absorbing is really like a like dosage. There's a certain amount that you should be absorbing before it starts to be to increase your chances for skin cancer. So, you know, not good in large amounts. Like daily activities, like walking to the store, walking to a park, that kind of stuff is no big deal. It's just if you expose your entire body on a beach for a long period of time, that's why they have sunscreen. Okay. And if you keep increasing the, way, the, the frequency, then we get to x-rays. Well, what do x-rays do? They penetrate your body. They penetrate all the organic tissue in your body except for the bone. All right? You know that you can't take x-rays whenever you want. Your doctor has to have a chart. Every time you take an x-ray, your doctor has to know about it so they can log the total dosage that you receive. Right? Because too many x-rays now increases your chances of some kind of cancer. Gamma rays, um, this is like nuclear decay Chernobyl level, okay? You're exposed to gamma rays, depending on how, many, how much exposure you have, you could literally, it could be fatal. Like you could die, you know, 
within days if you're exposed to too much of this. And this is what happened to a lot of the workers at Chernobyl. When their plant melted down, they literally had people running in there trying to clean up the mess, but they had to limit their exposure. So they'd run there and work for like 30 seconds and run out of the room and they'd bring another shift. And they had all these people, you know, because if they didn't alternate the shifts, it'd be like a death sentence to go in there and clean. What kind of job is worth that, right? Okay, anyways, what's that? On the other, yeah, they give you a bonus, right? They give you extra vacation days, right? As the wavelengths get longer, you get to infrared. Infrared is coincidentally right next to red. Violet is just next to violet, so that kind of helps. So infrared, the wavelengths get longer, right? So infrared is um, light waves that are they're um, known as heat waves. So when you go to Popeye's chicken and you see those pieces of chicken sitting underneath that heating lamp, that's, that's an infrared lamp, basically. Right? And that helps keep it warm. You don't actually see these waves, but like if you sit next to a fireplace, infrared red rays are coming out towards you and they're help keeping you warm. Okay. And then you get longer, then we get to microwaves. Uh, microwaves were developed as a method of communications prior to World War II. And then we get into radio waves. Now, it's not very, people don't have radios anymore. And I'm not even sure in cars, do they still build cars with radios? Okay, for the old people who buy the cars. Yeah. Okay. So, but anybody have a radio in your house? A couple of you, like four of you. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, in the old days, you just turn on the radio and you listen to whatever music some guy in a station put on and played on the radio, not like on demand, right? You were just kind of like subject to whatever he felt like playing. Anyways, here is the entire spectrum. Okay. So is that like separation between like ultraviolet visible and that like arbitrary or is there like... Yes, this is a smooth continuum. There's not literally a hard cutoff. It's the wave as it gradually changes in wavelength, gradually morphs one type into another, into another, to another. Like um, high energy X-rays and gamma rays, I mean, it's, it's just like a, a gradual change. Okay. All right, so. Oh, so back to visible light. All of these colors are available in the visible light. And the sum of all these colors is what we know as white light. When you take all the colors of the visible spectrum and you add them together, it just looks like regular light. Like right now we are being showered by white light. You do not see the individual components, but they're there, right? right? We're being hit by violets, by blues, by oranges, by greens, by yellows and reds. But the sum of them together appears how it appears to us. We could prove that white light contains them all. If we take white light and we shy it through a refractive surface, which ends up separating out those different wavelengths based on, uh, based on the wavelength. Okay, so the longer wavelengths don't bend as much, and so we get the red separated from the orange, from the yellow, the green, the blue, indigo, and violet. All right? did you know that Pink Floyd were physicists? <laughs> well, why else would they put this on their cover? All right, Dark Side of the Moon. If I ever released an album, maybe I'd put like a redox reaction on the cover. Just like the equation. Yeah, just the equation. And then like, you know, 0.0001% of the population would understand what's going on. Okay. I don't think you would sell that one. I'd give it away for free. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, I didn't grade your test yet. <laughs> so... <laughs> We talked about the red being the, the long end and the violet being the short end. Okay, so um, now let's talk about the mathematical relationship. Okay, C equals lambda nu. C is the speed of light, speed of light constant, okay? And it has a fixed value. The value is 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now, there's a caveat here. That is the value if light were traveling through a vacuum, meaning not, inter not being interfered with with any other kind of particulate matter, like gases, like air, space dust, or whatever, okay? So we're just going to use that value because the amount of change that any of that would, that would 
be caused by the air atmosphere is negligible. Okay, so we're just going to use that. Uh, this guy is lambda. Lambda is the symbol that's going to represent the wavelength. And remember that we want our wavelength in meters, but if it is provided to you in different units, you need to convert it to meters. So the, the most common wavelength that you're going to see is nanometers. It's 10 to the ninth nanometers in one meter. And so that's the conversion you'll use to go back and forth. Okay. Then we've got new, Greek letter new. It's, that's the frequency. And we mentioned that frequency is measured as hertz, which is one over seconds. So if you think about it, when you put these units together, if the speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, uh, the units on lambda are going to be meters, and the units on frequency are going to be hertz, and those units make sense then. Given that this is a three-variable equation, one of which includes a constant, that means you can always find the frequency if you have the wavelength and vice versa. All you need is one of the values and you can find the other. Okay, so our second equation relates the frequency to the energy of the photon. All right, and I should specifically point out this is energy of a single photon. Because energy can sometimes be quantified as far as uh, per mole of photons. And if it was per mole, then you'd in invoke Avogadro's number. Okay. So this is the energy of a photon, a singular photon. How do we find the energy of the photon? Well, you're going to use the frequency, but you're also going to use a new constant, which is called Planck's constant. Planck's constant is a way of quantifying the amount of energy carried by a singular photon, and it's dependent upon its energy. So as long as you know the frequency, just multiply it by Planck's constant, and you will have the energy of the photon. Okay? Both of these equations are on the AP formula sheet. So let's talk practicality. Let's just put one uh, example here to work. Let's say that we have blue light, and let's say that we know the wavelength is 452 nanometers. We want to be able to solve for the frequency and the energy, right? So if I am given the wavelength, and I want to solve for the frequency, it's a pretty simple rearrangement here. It's just going to be the speed of light constant divided by the wavelength, but your, unit, your units have to cancel. So because the speed of light is 2 point. 998 meters per second, you've got to convert your wavelength into meters. So 452 nanometers per meter, there's 10 to the ninth nanometers, which means 4.52 times 10 to the negative second, seventh meters. Okay, that is our That's our wavelength. So, oh wait, I'm missing an exponent here. Hang on a second. Times 10 to the eighth. These are all too close together when you move them apart. All right, so what do we get? Oh, this is a good number to store in your calculator, by the way, the speed of light. Just put it in under C. Okay, so our frequency comes out as 6.63 times 10 to the 14th hertz. So we answered the first question. The second question, then they want us to find energy, no problem, because energy is simply the frequency times Planck's constant. So 
6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds, not joules per second, joules times seconds, multiplied by 6.63 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Notice how our seconds cancel. Okay, so... Four point uh, three nine times ten to the negative nineteenth joules per photon. Okay, so what did we just do here? We we were told that we had light with a specific wavelength. If you know the wavelength, you can find the frequency. If you can find the frequency, you can find the energy. In fact. All you need is one quantity. All you need is one number, and you can find out everything else because we're working with two constants. right? We could have done this backwards, and I can give you a value for energy and said, what's the wavelength? right? So if I said you know, the energy is such and such, then you're going to plug the energy in here. You're going to solve for the frequency. And then once you have the frequency, you plug the frequency in, you solve for the wavelength. OK? All right, so, oh, by con we're not done yet. By convention, uh, energy is expressed in kilojoules per mole. So since that is how many joules there are per photon, right, there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd photons in a mole. And then there's 1,000 joules per kilogram. So multiply this by Avogadro's number. Divide by a thousand. So this is going to be two hundred and sixty five kilojoules per mole. And guess what we could do with that amount of energy? Oh, shine it at say water in a calorimeter and raise its temperature. And then to calculate, you know, what the final temperature is gonna be. Right? Everything is connected. Okay. Um, all right, so are we okay with using a value and finding one if you have the other? Either frequency, wavelength, or energy, all of these values are interconnected. They all describe uh, a photon, and the photon is electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation, there's many types. So we can calculate the, the wavelength of infrared. We can calculate the wavelength of x-rays, of radio waves, whatever it is. It doesn't matter, right? They're all tied by the same physical constraints, the same laws, the same equations. All right, but what does that have to do with chemistry? Well, funny you should ask. Let's start with hydrogen. In a hydrogen atom, we mentioned that electrons... When they absorb energy, they jump up and they fall back down. So because we're talking about electrons that are in atoms, and these transitions happen whenever the atom receives energy, these photons that are released, lots of them can be observed directly using something like a spectroscope. So in the case of hydrogen, hydrogen has three or four prominent uh, visual changes taking place. Okay, so the electron transition from energy level 3 to energy level 2, that change in energy can be calculated into a frequency, which can be calculated to a wavelength, which would turn out to be red. Another transition is from energy level 4 to energy level 2. Energy level 4 to 2, that's falling a greater distance, right? So the change in energy is greater. The change in energy, if it's change in energy is greater, that means the frequency is greater, which means the wavelength will be shorter, which is why it's kind of on the blue end. If we go from 5 to 2, that is yet a further distance that the electron is falling. And so the greater distance, the more energy that's released, the higher the frequency, the shorter the wave. That's why this guy is all the way over here in the blue region. 
Now, you can imagine that these are just the visible transitions. There's all sorts of other transitions that are happening that are outside the realm of the visible range. So a transition, say, from, from um, 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 would not be visible to us. Those would be somewhere over here. A transition from, like, 5 to 4 would probably be somewhere over here. Because the closer you get to the nucleus, the more energy that is released. Right? You end up forming an attraction which releases more energy because it's exothermic. All right. This can be calculated. We can calculate the energy of an electron using this constant. Negative 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18th over the energy level squared. This provides the energy of the electron based on what level it's in. Now, so another caveat. This value here applies to hydrogen only. And the reason why we're focusing on hydrogen is because hydrogen is monoelectric. Hydrogen has one electron, which means when electrons fall from here, from anywhere, when they fall towards the nucleus, there is no interference. There's only one electron. There's no other electrons getting in the way. If this were helium, if this were helium, okay, so let's say there's an electron here, he's falling, and let's say that there's another electron somewhere below, that other electron below is going to have repulsive forces, and it's going to change the trajectory of that electron. It's not going to have a straight inward attraction towards the nucleus, and that's going to complicate the amount of energy and the interactions between the nucleus and that falling electron. So which means if this were helium, this number would keep changing. And that's just with two electrons. Imagine if this were carbon with six electrons. An electron falling, but now there's five electrons in the way. So, so this calculation is a very simple and very clean calculation only when you're talking about an electron, when there's only one electron in an atom. Okay. This is, we're not going to be calculating this for any other atoms because it, you just can't. Not with what we have, not with the tools we have. All right. Anyways, change in energy. How do we calculate the change in energy? It's the, the, it's the energy of the final minus the energy of the initial. I should say actually E final minus E initial. Sorry. E final minus E initial. How do you find E final? Well, E final is negative 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18th over N, whatever the energy level where it ends up as squared. What's E initial? The same exact thing, but with the initial and initial instead. So we can calculate how much energy change there is when an electron falls from, say, energy level 3 to energy level 2. Okay, let's take a second and let's do that. So if it's falling from 3 to 2, 3 is the initial, 2 is the final.
with this value? Yeah. The only time we're working with this value is in the context of hydrogen. So can I save it? You could. Uh, maybe save it under H. No, H is Planck's constant. Um, I don't know what you put it under. I don't know. What do we get? How much energy change is there when it falls from 3 to 2? And you sh your sign should be reflective because if the electron is falling, then the en that's a loss of energy. Right? The closer it gets to the nucleus, the more energy is released. So you, you should have a negative sign here. What did we get? Eddie, what would you get? No. Nick? Right. There is a release of 3.025 times 10 to the 19th joules. And it seems like a small number, but remember, this is just one photon. So that is our delta E. And if that's how much energy is released, we can take that energy. We can solve for what the frequency is and what the wavelength is. So E over H will give us nu. Okay, so take that, divide by Planck's. Yeah, so for the, um, for the frequency and wavelength, we don't deal with negative numbers. Yeah, just take the absolute value then. This is our frequency. So our wavelength would be Six point five seven times ten to the negative seventh meters, which in nanometers would be six hundred and fifty seven nanometers. What color is that? Red orange, yeah. And the border red. Okay, let's pause here and make sure that everybody understands what just happened. Okay. For hyd and you know for hydrogen, we can calculate the energy of electron transitions. Electrons jump up, jump oops, they jump up, they jump down. When they fall down is when the energy is released. That's when the photon is released. So anytime an electron falls down, right, we can calculate how much energy change there is as long as you know what the energy levels were, as long as you know where it started and where it ended. Plug them in here. Calculate your delta E, right, because that's the final this minus this gives us that. Once we have the energy, we can find our frequency, which means we can find our wavelength. Now, it very possibly could be that you calculate this again, and you get a wavelength which falls outside of the realm of the visible. No big deal. If it does fall outside the realm of the visible, right, you have a rough idea. It's probably going to be ultraviolet or infrared. Right, depending on the wavelength is longer. If it's longer than red, then it's infrared. If it's shorter than violet, then it's ultraviolet. Okay. Okay. So in our lab tomorrow, we are going to observe different spectra types. And I alluded to these, but I want to specifically point them out and define them. Continuous spectra, you don't need any tools to observe. It's just what's above you. You're, observe, you're hit with continuous spectra every time the sun goes up, every time you turn on a light bulb. It's just white light. All of the colors combined. Okay. Emission spectra is what we just described. There, it's light that's ex emitted by excited electrons after they fall back down to their lower energy levels just like what we calculated in hydrogen. When the electrons, after they've jumped up, when they fall back down, their individual transitions correlate to different wavelengths, and those wavelengths might be visible. Okay? And then absorption spectra. So absorption spectra is kind of the opposite. With absorption spectra, imagine if I took a source of light, like let's say I had... Um, an element, 
in a tube that was put into one of our electric boxes and it was emitting light, okay? Because we're gonna be using these, these electric boxes and there's a gas in here. I don't know, let's just say the gas is neon, right? And I electrify it, so we, we hook it up to a power source and it's emitting light, just like a neon sign would in front of a liquor store or a, a Starbucks. And so this light that's being emitted, what if that light were uh, shining through some kind of solution of some kind? All right, so let's say you're standing in front of a, I mean a Starbucks, and let's say that you brought with your chemical kit and you make a solution right there and you hold that solution right in front of that neon light. This solution is going to filter some of that light. And so what you get out of the other end of that solution is less light than, when in, than went into it. Does this make sense? That solution that we made is absorbing some of that light. And so what is absorbed appears as dark bands. It appears as absent because specific wavelengths can be absorbed by specific solutions. Okay, so three types of spectra. Tomorrow's lab incorporates the bottom two because the first one, we don't need anything special to demonstrate that. All right, let's recap. So we start off with a Bohr diagram. Bohr diagram tells us where energy levels are, where electrons can jump up to and fall back down to. Okay. We will break down the Bohr diagram in more detail later when we start talking about electron configurations and orbitals and things like that. Uh, where an electron normally resides is the ground state. When the electron absorbs energy, it rises to a higher energy level. That's called the excited state, but it's very temporary. It cannot stay there. When the electron falls, a photon is released. Photons have char wave characteristics, and that's one of those wave characteristics is wavelength. From wavelength, we can calculate how frequent that wave is, how many waves pass per second. Mathematically, these can be tied together. Electromagnetic radiation is also known as light. It's just quicker to say light than electromagnetic radiation every time. right? You don't, you know, your mom doesn't, come into your room, open up the shade, and you say, ah, too much electromagnetic radiation, right? That, that's not words you use at home, okay? Anyways, you are, are only able to interpret a small region of it, but there is a wide range of it. Some of it's bad for you, okay? Whatever the wavelength is, you can calculate the frequency Whatever the frequency is, you can calculate the energy and vice versa. These two equations, when intertwined, oh, this, this is if we combine them, if we rearrange them, solve for frequency and substitute it in, right? We would get this. Um, it's called the de Broglie equation. Um, it's not entirely necessary because you, it's still the same result. You'll still be able to solve for what you need to solve for. Planck's constant, speed of light constant is we're gonna, what we're going to use. You should know those. I think they're on the formula sheet, so maybe not. And then electrons jump up and down in hydrogen. You need to be able to calculate how much energy change occurs when an electron falls from level Y to level X. And then turn that into an energy, turn it into a wave, wavelength, and then identify what type of wave. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Different spectra types. White light is all around you. The emission spectra is specific lines, due to specific transitions taking place. Absorption is when you have broad range light that you're sending through and you're filtering specific lines out. So they're kind of like opposites of each other. Okay, and that's what you need to know for light for the first lab.